Good afternoon, all. This is Ted Welsh, the Director for the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center. I'd like to welcome you all for joining us in the latest of our webinar series presentations. Um, just want to take a quick minute up front to give you an overview. Hopefully, most, if not all, are aware of what the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center provides, but just in case you aren't, um, again, DSIAC, or Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, reports up through the Defense Technical Information Center, ultimately to the Undersecretary of Defense, Research, and Engineering. We operate as a government-owned, contractor-operated entity, supporting the bench scientists, 6-1 activities, up through the warfighter, 6-3 activities, principally in terms of advanced technology, identification. And in that context, the primary mission areas that we have are oriented towards collecting and curating scientific and technical information, conducting information research and analysis, and dissemination of scientific and technical information for which this webinar series is one of those uh, products that of, of a number that we perform to help promote information sharing, collaboration within the defense system scientific and techno technology community. So again, the, these webinars hopefully promote a, an awareness, uh, a greater understanding of our role. Uh, we provide a variety of services and products, and again, host a website where those all can be you know, accessed and a greater awareness can be found if there's not already, and that's uh, the dsi.org website. I welcome you all to uh, check that out if you haven't already. And with that, I will go ahead and turn over the proceedings and the mic to our presenters. And again, this, this uh, webinar is entitled or orchestrated towards dealing with UV light specific uh, wavelength of UV light for continuous disinfection for occupied buildings and vehicles. So again, with that, I'll turn it over to Jamie and PJ, who will be your presenters today. We will have a Q&A session at the end, and you can kind of chime in with uh, uh, Q&As via the chat, and I'll keep track of them, and we'll facilitate getting them answered at the end of the briefing. Thanks. Okay. So uh, this is Jamie Childress. I'm with uh, Boeing Research and Technology. And uh, I, along with my, uh, my cohort, uh, PJ Piper from uh, Far UV Technologies, are going to be talking to you today about uh, 222 nanometer ultraviolet light uh, for continuous disinfection. And I'm going to talk to you, uh, I'm going to give the, the first part of this, uh, which is about uh, 222 nanometer uh, technology. And then PJ is going to uh, take over and talk to you about various applications. So uh, Sharon, let's go to chart two. Uh, so the bottom line here is that uh, 222 nanometer UV uh, is both safer and more effective than uh, uh, older uh, systems. So let's say the older systems are the longer wavelength systems, which include mercury lamps and, and longer wavelength LEDs. And so 222 actually will allow continuous disinfection in occupied areas, which is not possible with older UV systems. And um, the, you know, since I like to, you know, kind of give the bottom line up front, the, 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 the why is because uh, 222 is uh, highly absorbed by both protein and DNA, and the older UV systems are really only absorbed by DNA. And uh, you're going to see in a little bit that that makes a big difference. So, um, Sharon, let's go to slide three, please. So, um, this is a very brief history of UV disinfection. Uh, it, UV light has been used for uh, germicidal uh, purposes since the 1930s. And um, back in the, uh, the 30s, uh, it was discovered that uh, mercury lamps uh, had germicidal properties, and then, you know, over time it was discovered that it was very specifically the 254 nanometer um, light frequency that came from those mercury lamps that was, uh, 
you know, giving, you know, uh, killing viruses and bacteria. And so as a consequence of that, and that has been around since the 1930s, uh, almost all of the data that you see actually on uh, germicidal properties of UV is very specifically the germicidal properties of 254 nanometer light. And uh, then in relatively recent years, uh, LEDs have come along that emit useful germicidal frequencies uh, between 260 and 280 nanometers. And those uh, LEDs in the 260 to 280 nanometer range have very, very similar properties to 254. So that you can sort of think of that uh, sort of 254 to 280 nanometer range as being uh, all more or less the same sort of flavor of UV, if you will. Um, then only very recently, really, has there been sort of a, uh, a, a new flavor. So you can almost think of that uh, 254 to 280 nanometer range as being sort of vanilla UV, if you will. And uh, so the, the new, uh, you know, uh, Ben & Jerry's, uh, you know, chocolate extra special UV is now this uh, 222, which is a, a completely different frequency of light. And so let's go to slide four, and uh, we'll give you sort of a little better overview of the electromagnetic spectrum here. So as you can see in the slide four, uh, the ultraviolet light is to the left of the visible spectrum. And uh, so it's, uh, you know, this kind of goes without saying, but, uh, but it just, uh, just to make, make sure everybody, everybody gets it. So ultraviolet light is, is invisible. So um, all of these light frequencies that uh, we're going to be talking about are, are, are invisible to humans. Um, and the, but even within this ultraviolet band, uh, not all light is the same. So there's, you know, essentially a spectrum of ultraviolet light, and that spectrum is um, divided into UVA, UVB, uh, UVC, and far UV. And um, so UVA is essentially what people normally refer to as black light, so kind of your black light poster sort of light. Um, and it's very close to visible light. Uh, UVB is the, the portion of sunlight that uh, gives you a sunburn, and so UVA and UVB are present in sunlight. Uh, when you get down to UVC, which is, begins around 280 nanometers, uh, that's no longer present in sunlight, and, and that's one of the reasons why it is germicidal is because microbes haven't developed defenses against it since it's not normally present in sunlight. So uh, mercury lamps are at two, 254 nanometers, and, and uh, so if you're not familiar with nanometers, it's the uh, essentially the length of uh, the length of the wavelength. Um, and then down in the far UV range is the 222, and uh, so that's what we're going to be really focusing on today is uh, 222 and how it's different from uh, existing wavelengths. So let's go to slide five. And one of the reasons that uh, you're probably not familiar with 222 is that uh, 222 Exmer lamps are a pretty new thing. And actually making UV light in general is actually not uh, that easy, at least not the germicidal uh, wavelengths are not that easy to make. Um, and in the particular, uh, 222 is, is something that's only been able to be, be made, you know, in a sort of a semi-efficient way fairly recently. And the way that you make them uh, is with an eczema lamp. And um, an eczema lamp is, is essentially a glass bottle filled with gas and uh, lined with high-voltage electrodes. And then uh, a lightning storm effectively is, is uh, precipitated in that lightning bottle. And uh, so there's a high-voltage lightning storm uh, that discharges between the inner and outer electrodes. And that discharge actually creates a temporary molecule. And it's that decay of that temporary molecule that actually creates the, the light. And, in, and now, eczema lamps uh, can be made with you know, lots of uh, different kinds of gases. And the, the gas that is uh, in the, the, uh, the lamp actually determines the light frequency that it generates. So it, uh, in the case of uh, cre creating 222 nanometer light, uh, a mixture of krypton and chlorine gas uh, will emit 222 nanometer light uh, with this uh, high frequency lightning storm in the bottle. So if you look at the, the graph on the right, 
you see the uh, the wavelengths emitted from a, a krypton chlorine gas uh, filled eczema lamp, and you'll see that the the preponderance of the light that is emitted uh, is at, at 222, but there is some amount of light that is emitted at higher frequencies at the say 240 to 260 nanometer range, and uh, those are actually undesirable frequencies because those frequencies uh, could give you cancer. So uh, typically for the 222 nanometer systems, we also uh, add a uh, low-pass filter to the, to the lamp, and that cuts out this small portion of uh, light that is uh, uh, emitted in, in that, those higher wavelengths, and that, that, that's kind of important to do. Uh, there are such things as 222 nanometer LEDs, but they're only really in, in research. There's no mass production of 222 nanometer LEDs. And uh, the uh, 222 nanometer LEDs that are, are in research, they are uh, they're very, very low efficiency. So their efficiency is typically uh, less than 1% and, and pretty often uh, much, much less than 1%, so a very tiny fraction of 1%, actually. So you can think of, like, 222 nanometer LEDs as really more like a, uh, a small electric heater that happens to emit a small amount of, of 222. Uh, so, it's, so it's difficult to make, uh, and uh, but there now are uh, commercially available 222 nanometer excimer lamps, and so we're, you know, going to take advantage of that. Um, so let's go to slide 6. And uh, this is going to help explain why we are uh, interested in using 222 as opposed to 254 nanometer mercury lamps or, or the uh, similar, so, you know, uh, LEDs in the 260 to 280 nanometer range. Uh, so really I'm just going to focus on the, the graph on the right-hand side of, of this chart. Uh, the horizontal axis of the graph there at the, at the bottom is uh, uh, wavelengths, so wavelengths of light in, in, in nanometers. And then the vertical axis is the uh, absorption of those wavelengths in two different molecules. So the, the blue line is DNA molecules, and the green line is protein molecules. And so if you... Uh, Let's look at the 254 nanometer line there, that, which is the red line. And you'll notice that um, it intersects the blue DNA line pretty high up on the graph. So it's got, uh, so DNA strongly absorbs 254. Um, but it intercepts the protein line very low on the graph. So protein uh, doesn't absorb 254 very readily. So it you know, pretty much passes through protein. Uh, Know, without too much trouble. Um, now, if we look at the 222 nanometer line, uh, we we'll see that the 222 nanometer uh, wavelength is very highly absorbed by both DNA and protein. So it's got sort of a similar absorption of the of DNA uh, in in DNA, but it's uh, but it's much much higher absorption of protein than 254. And um, so that actually proves to be a, a really important thing. And uh, so really the, the key takeaway from this slide is that, um, is that protein has 25 times better absorption of 222 uh, compared to 254. Um, and, uh, but the, the uh, DNA absorption is similar. So, so protein is highly absorbed by uh, only 222, really, of those two frequencies. So let's, let's go to slide seven, and you'll see why this matters. Uh, so the bottom line of why this matters is because all cell walls are made of, of protein. So the, and that's the cell walls of uh, viruses and bacteria, or the cell walls of, uh, of any part of yourself is made of, of uh, protein. And so that means that skin uh, is mostly protein, actually. And so what this, uh, the, so, so the graph on the left-hand side of this chart, uh, the, again, the horizontal axis is, is uh, wavelengths, so uh, UV wavelengths in nanometers. Uh, the vertical axis is the, 
the opposite of absorption, which is transmittance. And um, so uh, the, let's look at the, the, you know, the lines on the graph here now. So the green line on the graph is the transmittance for all these different wavelengths of the stratum corneum. And the stratum corneum is the outer layer of your skin. So the stratum corneum, you could sort of think of that as sort of like the, uh, the bark on a tree, only it's the, uh, the bark on, on your skin. And the stratum corneum is a dead layer of skin on the outside of you, and it's this dead layer that allows you to uh, scratch the back of your hand without, without bleeding, because since it's dead, uh, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no live cells there, and uh, uh, it's so constantly being sloughed off of your body. And uh, so the, if we uh, then look at the, the next line, the, the uh, purple line, uh, the purple line below the green line is the penetration of different wavelengths uh, through the epidermis. And the epidermis is another outer layer of your skin, and it's essentially the last layer of your skin uh, above the uh, portion of, the, of your uh, skin that's actually creating new cells, which is the, or basal cells. And uh, so really, the, uh, ultimately, the goal is that you have, uh, if nothing penetrates the epidermis, then uh, you're good and you're, you can't get cancer. Uh, so now let's look at uh, 254 nanometers, which is the, uh, gonna, there's an arrow there pointing to where that passes through the, each of these lines. And about 50% of 254 nanometer light makes it through the stratum corneum, so essentially makes it through your bark. Uh, and around 3% of it makes it through the epidermis. And so it's that 3% that makes it through the epidermis that causes the trouble. So that 3% uh, making it through the epidermis into the basal cells uh, gives you a skin cancer risk of, if you had chronic exposure to 254 of about one person in 3,000. And so it's this skin cancer risk of one person in 3,000 that means that um, older UV technology, so 254 and that, and which um, you notice that if you uh, look at the uh, the graph in there, the 260 to 280 nanometer range. Um, again, you know, it's uh, sort of similar numbers, right? So, so any of those wavelengths, whether it's um, whether it's a mercury lamp or it's uh, UV LEDs, uh, all of those wavelengths are capable of giving you cancer in, in, a, in approximately that that range. And so, you cannot really use them in an occupied area. So for you to disinfect an area with either mercury lamps or UV LEDs, you really need to uh, remove all the people from that area. So now let's look at uh, 222. So if we look at the uh, vertical blue line there, which uh, lines up with 222, we see that uh, only about 0.03% makes it through the stratum corneum because, of course, the stratum corneum is mostly made of protein. Um, and uh, because 222 interacts with highly with protein, it doesn't really make it through that very well. Um, and roughly 0% makes it through the epidermis. And so your skin cancer risk is, is actually less than one person in a quadrillion uh, and uh, I think the, I, I checked uh, last night, and there's um, uh, something like uh, 7.9 billion people on the planet, um, so uh, uh, that, which is considerably less than than a quadrillion. So uh, that means that uh, 222 is actually very very safe from the standpoint of, of giving you cancer. In fact, uh, you see the you know. As, noted on this slide, uh, 222 UV is actually considerably safer than sunlight because uh, your risk from, of cancer from sunlight is uh, much, much greater than that. Uh, so let's go to slide eight. Uh, so there has been quite a lot of, of uh, safety data that has been collected on uh, 222 nanometer UV uh, just in the last just in the last few years. So again, uh, it's only very recently that really 222 nanometer UV has been commercially available. So 222 eczema lamps. Uh, so since it's only very very recently that's been available, the the uh, data on it uh, is 
you know, fairly new, but uh, that data is, is all pretty consistent, uh, which shows that uh, it is uh, it's very safe. Um, it's very safe for humans. And, uh, you know, those studies support uh, raising the, the human daily exposure limit with the TLV to, to well over 500 millijoules per square centimeter. And for those of you who don't speak millijoules per square centimeter, um, that is a measure of the energy, the total energy of light that's been deposited on a surface, uh, both in by the intensity of light as well as the amount of time that went on. And um, so uh, 500 millijoules is uh, actually quite a lot of light. Uh, and so human and, and animal skin tests up to a, even 1,000 a millijoules have uh, been done with no adverse effects. Um, uh, animal eye tests have been done up to 600 millijoules uh, with no adverse effects. And um, uh, one of the reasons that, uh, that this is the case is that there is a, uh, uh, a layer sort of similar to the uh, stratum corneum on the eye called the tear layer, which is essentially the uh, outer protective layer of the eye. And uh, so that also uh, basically absorbs the 222 before it can damage anything in, in your eye. And one, one thing to keep in mind with these numbers, the uh, 1,000 millijoules and the 600 millijoules, is those were not where, let's say, damage started. That was actually the maximum value in the test. So we don't actually know what the upper limit is uh, because that would just happen to be the limit that was used in, in, the, uh, in the test. So, so we don't, don't really know uh, what the true upper limit, if, if in fact there is an upper limit. Um, so another uh, test that's very, very interesting is uh, Columbia University uh, has been doing a, a testing of Dr. David Brenner on uh, hairless mice. And uh, he uh, is concluding right now a 60-week study of, uh, of hairless mice. And a 60-week is literally uh, the lifetime of these mice. So at the end of the 60 weeks, the uh, mice are essentially geriatric uh, mice. And um, then uh, and, and those, those mice were exposed for eight hours a day, five days a week, to 500 millijoules per square centimeter uh, and for their entire life and with no adverse effects detected. So uh, uh, the postmortem autopsies and pathology are, uh, on that are in process, but uh, it is anticipated that uh, there will be no, no damage detected from that, that analysis. Um, in the lower right of this chart, you see uh, yet a, another graphic example of the difference between, say, 254 or older UV lights and 222. Uh, the horizontal axis is in uh, millijoules per square centimeter, again, which is the, uh, essentially you could think of that as the, the dose of, uh, of UV light, so it's the, the total energy deposited. Uh, and in the case of 254, um, you'll notice that the, uh, the cell uh, DNA damage, as uh, defined by the uh, CPDs, which are essentially uh, uh, lesions on the DNA, so d DNA damage, um, you notice as the, as the total energy goes up, the uh, DNA damage uh, goes up, so, and, and uh, uh, quite a lot of damage is created. In the case of 222, which is along the bottom of the chart, uh, even as the fluence goes up, there is really no change from zero. So, again, uh, further evidence that uh, 222 is relatively harmless to humans and, and potentially completely harmless to humans. Uh, so let's go on to chart nine. So chart nine uh, really shows us the kind of what the regulatory situation is, and and uh, and uh, 222 is uh, regulated by the EPA as a pesticide device, and and no FDA regulation is required unless it's used as part of a uh, some kind of medical treatment of some sort, um, and the. Uh, most people, you know, most organizations follow the uh, ACGIH, which is the American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists, uh, threshold uh, limit value for uh, particular UV wavelengths, which is uh, also known as the, the TLV. And uh, so in the right-hand side of this, this chart, you see a, a graph 
showing the uh, uh, TLV for a wide variety of UV wavelengths. And you'll notice that 222 is uh, only at 23 millijoules per square centimeter. And, uh, but, but yet we have uh, plenty of data showing that even more than 500 millijoules uh, appears to be completely safe. And that's just because uh, since you know, 222 uh, uh, lamps have really only been commercially available for a short period of time, the, um, this 23 millijoules number was based upon uh, an extrapolation of, uh, uh, you know, other UV effectively, other UV wavelengths um, extrapolating out through, through uh, 222. And uh, so it was not based upon clinical studies. And so there's a, a fair bit of effort right now uh, going into revising this TLV, and it is uh, hoped that uh, fairly shortly uh, later this year that the, uh, the TLV for 222 uh, will be raised into that uh, sort of 500 millijoule per square centimeter number. So uh, although the uh, TLV for uh, 222 is already higher than it is for, say, 254, so 254 is only 6 millijoules, um, and, uh, say, uh, 270 nanometers is only 3 millijoules, so it's already considerably higher, but uh, the uh, uh, the word on the street is that uh, it's going to get considerably higher, uh, you know, much more into the 500 millijoule type number later this year. So let's go to slide 10. So as, as we've seen, uh, 222 is uh, fairly harmless to humans, but uh, is it also harmless to pathogens or is it deadly to pathogens? And it turns out that it's, it's quite deadly to pathogens. And the reason that it's deadly to pathogens but uh, harmless to humans is because uh, viruses and bacteria are really, really tiny. They're uh, orders of magnitude smaller than, than uh, human cells. Um, and uh, so uh, to put, put that in scale, so viruses are you know, typically in the, say, the 100 nanometer diameter range. Um, so specifically, let's say the SARS-CoV-2 virus is roughly 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, bacteria, so 100 nanometers is uh, 0.1 microns in diameter. Bacteria are, uh, are at one micron in diameter, roughly. And uh, whereas human cells are more like about 40 microns in diameter, and uh, 222 nanometer UV is typically capable of penetrating, say, three to five microns into a protein. And um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, all cell walls are made of protein. And so in the case of uh, a human cell, actually, uh, 222 UV uh, cannot even really penetrate into the center, uh, into the nucleus of a single human cell, much less through uh, your skin. Uh, but uh, it can fully penetrate viruses and it can fully penetrate bacteria. And since it interacts with uh, both protein, which the, essentially the viruses and bacteria are made of protein, um, as well as DNA, uh, it destroys both their DNA and their protein. And um, because it's destroying both their DNA and their protein and, and uh, they don't have a uh, thick protein shell, unlike us, uh, that uh, is, is very effective. So if you look at the the picture in the lower right, um, you see this is a, 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 a coronavirus, uh, it's the uh, COV OC43 coronavirus, and a, even a very small dose of uh, 222 is capable of uh, defeating this, this virus, so uh, even a, a fraction of a millijoule. So uh, kind of uh, compare that to the, say, more than 500 millijoules that uh, uh, would be safe for a human. And uh, you can see that uh, you can very easily kill things um, when humans are present. So uh, let's go to slide 11. And because everybody's, uh, of course, very, very interested in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, coronavirus because it's responsible for, um, for COVID-19. So uh, the required uh, UV dose for uh, for a 99.9% .9 surface dis disinfection of uh, SARS-CoV-2 
is uh, rough, roughly 6.5 millijoules per square centimeter for 254, but only 3 millijoules per square centimeter uh, for 222. And uh, uh, although it's, you know, we don't have uh, some, you know, exact studies of indicating exactly why 222 is uh, so much more effective, but it's because of the protein interaction, it's likely that it is due to the fact that the, uh, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as uh, pretty much all viruses, have uh, a protein outer shell, and uh, so that interaction with protein is probably uh, has a uh, substantial amount to do with why it's so much more effective. Um, so, uh, so. Bottom line, I guess, takeaway from this is that uh, 222 is uh, at least as effective, if not more effective, than 254, um, but it's considerably safer. So let's go to slide 12. So this is kind of uh, uh, my last uh, tech slide, and then we'll uh, move over to, uh, to the applications. So the kind of the last thing about 222 that is, uh, is of note is that because of that protein interaction, it's not subject to a, uh, a thing called photoreactivation. So both 222 as well as the 254 or the 260 to 280 nanometer uh, UV damage uh, the DNA of, of the target organism. Um, that actually does not kill the virus or bacteria. It actually simply inactivates it. The 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 because the DNA is damaged, the uh, pathogen cannot reproduce itself, but it is still alive, so it's just inactivated. So it, it so and it, inactivation essentially means it, it cannot it can no longer replicate itself. So photoreactivation is actually a repair mechanism that uh, quite a number of microbes have uh, that allows them to repair that damage if they are subsequently exposed to blue light. So if you expose um, uh, pathogens that have a, what's known as a photolase gene um, uh, to uh, UV light and their DNA is damaged and they're, they're inactivated, if you subsequently expose them to ordinary light, so that includes blue light, uh, it will actually reactivate them and uh, so although you may think that you have disinfected that area, the area will become essentially reinfected within just a few hours after your exposure to ordinary blue light. So uh, 222 appears not to be subject to photoreactivation, and uh, the assumption in there is that uh, that's due to the fact that not only has a DNA been damaged, but also the cell wall of the pathogen has been damaged, and so um, the, the viruses or bacteria are truly killed. So they're not simply inactivated, they're actually killed. Uh, so let's go to slide 13. And uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna really cover much in the applications because uh, PJ is gonna, gonna do that. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, it is uh, highly effective for uh, disinfection um, as well as uh, safe for people. And you can use that in either high powered applications or you can have um, you know, some kind of automatic disinfection of occupied spaces. And uh, so now let's go to the next slide and uh, PJ can take it away. So PJ. Hi, thank you, Jamie. Um, yeah, well, that was, uh, that was a lot of great data. Um, and in fact, as I was watching through, I was, I was kind of thinking of a few notes. There's, there, you know, everybody loves kind of big numbers, but sometimes they're really hard to comprehend. And, you know, when, when you talk about a quadrillion, it really kind of goes off the charts. I tried looking up something after that ASP, uh, American Society for Photobiological um, presentation, that chart that you showed, and tried to find, you know, other examples of remote possibilities. And it turns out, uh, if that chart holds true, which of course it's extrapolated and, and, and very far, it, it, it would imply that it's a, a billion times less likely uh, to get skin cancer um, from far UV than either winning the lottery or uh, potentially, according to NASA, uh, the Earth getting hit by a 5 to 15 kilometer wide asteroid that would be an extinction event. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Um, uh, 
uh, in addition, um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the application, but I did also want to just kind of touch on the why, because a lot of people have asked, hey, with, with vaccines, you know, is this really necessary to outfit our facilities? And, and another interesting fact is that throughout reported history, more than one in every three people have died of infectious disease. Um, so while COVID has been horrible and has taken 500,000 lives, you know, as we look at the market right now in the U.S., you know, in terms of big numbers, again, you know, what we're really hoping to impact with with uh, far ultraviolet light uh, disinfection is potentially save 100 million lives. Um, and so it's 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 a significant um, significant play. Uh, I think the the other aspect that's often missed in this is that, and, and you touched on it uh, when you were talking about how it really is agnostic to the pathogen treated. Um, so regardless of the virus or bacteria, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to attack, you know, foodborne illnesses, E. coli, salmonella, listeria. It's going gonna, it's gonna to address hospital-acquired infections like um, uh, C. diff or, or MRSA. And, and, and it's interesting. I mean, it really boils down to, to, to really any of the pathogens, even mold uh, or fungus um, or, or even the common cold and flu. So I think, I think this, is really, this really is a solution to one of the most vexing problems um, you know, we've really had through, through, through human history. Um, but as, as far as the solutions go, um, if we can move to the next slide, I'll start to kind of talk about some of the some of the places where we have been um, where it's been utilized um, really far UV is best utilized in any higher traffic higher risk area and in theory it could really be used in any occupied setting as uh, you know safely and effectively as as, as Jamie pointed out um, there are still cost impacts and I think what's happening now is as the volumes are increasing, the costs of this technology are going to continue to come down. And it's going to make it more and more readily available and more, you know, a place where you can put it anywhere. Um, and, and most importantly, what's neat about far uv is unlike other um, disinfection options where you're totally reliant on uh, a human input, like wiping surfaces down or um, you know, spraying things with chemicals and adding, you know, kind of an environmental uh, uh, challenge into the area. Um, it's really independent of that. And, and so it's autonomous and it's continuous. And if you can see in the picture on the left, um, right under the facilities, you can basically see what, what a lot of these devices are. They're, they're, they're ceiling fixtures in many applications, um, which are set it and forget it solutions. And, you know, by the second day, it just, you know, appears like a smoke detector. And it's kind of a boring solution, but it is cleaning um, most of the air and, and the surfaces in, in that room. And in particular, the surfaces it touches. So it's not, it's a direct, it's a line of sight disinfection. So it's not gonna treat under that counter um, that you can see on the right side of that picture on the left. Um, but the part that people touch is generally the top of the counter. It's not the bottom. And if you think about the contamination events that occur with a respiratory disease, 100% of those contamination events happens when a person breathes, talks, coughs, sneezes, or sings. And the heavier particles fall relatively quickly to the tops of whatever the surfaces that are below um, that event. Um, and, and then medium-sized ones fall a little bit slower, uh, but they, they eventually all come, succumb to gravity the lightest particles actually can float around for hours. And so the concept of social distancing um, can be a little challenging when you all walk through the same door, right? So if that's gonna float around that doorway for two to three hours, that's, you know, can be challenging. And so a question we always get asked is, well, hey, when, when do I know it's safe to take my mask off? And I think we're gonna be facing this question for more than a year, I think, you know, are, you know, there are several, it, it's, it's been commonplace for people to wear masks for many years uh, in, in Asia. And I think that's because, you know, a lot of these, um, these, these outbreaks that have happened have shown, have, have, you know, made it clear that 
you know, these things are happening more often. Uh, if you look at the history of, you know, SARS, MERS, Ebola, you know, these things are hitting almost every three years. So in theory, the next one should be due in 2022, which is just next year. So we don't know how wide it'll spread, but I think a lot of the defenses that we put up are going to substantially mitigate that. But one interesting thing about all these defenses, whether it's social distancing, face masks, hand hygiene, or vaccines, is they're all just additional layers of defense. And they do nothing to actually reduce the viral load that's in the air or on the surfaces around you, whether it's COVID or whether it's the flu or, or, or regardless of what it is. And so I think what we're able to offer with far UV is now a solution that's actually playing some offense. Perhaps, you know, to borrow from a sports analogy, sometimes your best defense is actually playing pretty good offense. And, and I think a lot of the data that, that, that Jamie showed out there is right that. Um, and in application, again, it's pretty simple to install. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to install you know, a ceiling fixture. Any electrician can do it. Um, the next panel over is, is for airplanes. And, and I think this is a very interesting case. So we are working under an AppWorks uh, SBIR um, and uh, with Little Rock Air Force Base in, in particular. And, you know, we've been looking at the planes and we've been looking at cockpit disinfection. If you think about a cockpit and you can see the, the picture above is, is kind of a, a higher powered wand version. It's very hard to, to, for a person, again, this gets into the human error issue, a person to clean 500 knobs with a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a disinfecting wipe or something like that. It's just, it's literally almost impossible to do. And, um, you know, with a higher powered bulb, now, now the higher powered bulbs will exceed the TLV, so you would need uh, PPE uh, to wear. And you can see the, the, the woman there is wearing, you know, gloves and, you know, basically long sleeves. Nothing, not, it's not like a hazmat suit or anything. Um, but that device can actually disinfect those surfaces in less than a second up to a three log hill, up to 99.9% of uh, certainly the SARS-CoV-2 and, and really at that power, almost anything that, that, that's really going to be on there. Um, in terms of the different types of viruses, there's actually quite a bit of information out there. While, um, you know, this has been researched, like um, uh, Jamie mentioned uh, by Dr. Brenner at Columbia for, for quite some time, probably almost 10 years at this point. Um, you know, it's really been picked up by the others. So Dr. Sliney and Johns Hopkins with, you know, the standard setting uh, organizations, um, Harvard uh, Medical School, Colorado, uh, universities in Scotland and Japan and, and really across the world. So I don't think this is really as much a novel thing at this point. I think that the safety and efficacy has been proven. And now I think what we're really going into is a lot more of this applications development how can we use it? How can we rapidly deploy it? Um, and so there's a, there, there's a couple other applications. So the airplanes right now, one of the challenges is, is it takes longer to get something, you know, certified for use on an airplane. But going in between flights and cleaning uh, is very straightforward. Um, there's, there's not additional requirements there. So, so that's a great application for a wand. Um, airports, uh, if you go through the Atlanta, um, you know, uh, airport and the Delta terminal, you'll you'll see far UV there too. So it's it's spreading, you know, from actually the defense was one of the first first sectors to really kind of pick up and start using it. And and half of these pictures are um, really taken from some of our installations, at, you know, at Air Force bases. Um, it's even used at the highest levels of the Pentagon now too. So this is this is not, you know, look the as much as far UV is agnostic to the pathogen, the pathogens are really agnostic to any people catching this too. So regardless of your gender, your age, your ethnicity, or where you are, this is both a defense and a civilian need. Um, you can see that in the far right here, there's also um, uh, its use in, in mobile settings. Um, so just as you know, you could be you know, crowded in the in the hallway, shown on the picture on the left, you could also be getting onto a bus with multiple people. And so, uh, fortunately, a lot of these devices are powered with low voltage DC, so it's very easy to connect into those mobile applications as well. Um, and there's even, um, you know, just completely mobile 
and immediately deployable floor lamps uh, available too. Um, as you start to think forward though, there's, it's really any place where people congregate, those higher risk, higher, higher traffic areas where you'd wanna consider these. So we're also seeing a lot of uptake in dining facilities, athletic facilities. Think of any of the places where you would take off your mask. Um, one of the interesting studies that, that, that came out um, probably about three months ago now um, was actually they, they did the studies that you know, looked at the computational fluid dynamics of the, of the particles you know, that would be in the air going around the room and, and the impact of far UV on that. And it demonstrated that utilizing far UV in an occupied uh, indoor environment is equivalent to providing an extra N95 mask for everybody in those spaces. So if you're dining and you have to take off your mask, to, to eat or you're playing athletics and it's not exactly easy to um, you know wear a mask during that having far UV still allows you to have the same effective support but even above and beyond if it's continually disinfecting it's getting rid of the viral load completely and if you don't have the viral load you can't get infected um, if, if there isn't any present pathogen to infect you um, that's that's a true sign of safety so um, Logistics support, uh, there are national stock numbers now available for, for, for any of these devices. Um, so they are readily available without contracting issues. Um, some of the early you know, efforts we had, you know, we had to rely on sole source SBIR designation and things like that. But now with national stock numbers, they're readily available. Um, commissaries, secure rooms, uh, common sleeping areas. These are all areas where if there was one infected person, they could be spreading it through the air or on the surfaces that they might touch. Um, and then I just have one more slide of a couple more applications, if we can move forward to 16. Um, so these are other areas that, you know, again, that we're, we're touching on, uh, and a lot of them are defense related. Um, you know, most bases have visitor centers, um, conference rooms, auditoriums. Um, haven't seen as many offices on, I'm sorry, elevators on the bases, but, you know, that is an area where there isn't really even HVAC, um, you know, and, and HVAC is an interesting question, too, because somebody is, you know, there's, there's been questions around the cost effectiveness, and there's some interesting studies out. Actually, I think it was um, on, a, uh, on a recent webinar that showed that they, they were analyzing the differences between ventilation and UV disinfection, and um, I guess it's, it's nine and a half times more expensive just to ventilate the conditioned air out of your building versus using an ultraviolet-like solution. And so that's a really interesting case because a lot of people have thought, well, hey, um, I'll just get all fresh air and that'll be a lot cheaper than installing far UV lights. But in fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's, it's a lot more expensive to blow that conditioned air out of your, out of your building uh, similarly, to say, oh, we're just going to have somebody go in and wipe stuff down um, has turned out to be 50 to 100 times more expensive, you know, on a daily basis. It can be less than a couple of dollars um, to disinfect your space um, over the life, a thousand day life or something of, 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 a, uh, of one of these products versus paying somebody minimum wage even uh, at, you know, per, per 10 hours uh, to, on a daily basis to go around and clean this. Um, other applications, uh, bathrooms, recreational areas, um, a lot of healthcare. In fact, most of the, the, the initial calls were from healthcare providers because 70% um, of all hospital operating rooms have already utilized um, the older ultraviolet light um, to ensure their safety. And so it was a natural progression for someone to say, oh, well, we already know that is very effective. If you can now do it with an occupied space, this is perfect. So we're we are seeing a lot of uptake in the healthcare facilities. And not only mention that is, you know, when we talk about a higher risk area, well, if people are coming down with any ailment, whether it's a common cold flu or um, or a COVID, um, they would actually specifically go to those areas. Um, so you're you're, you're going to want to keep those those areas clean. And of course, schools are. Are a big push for you know some of the uh, the American Recovery Plan money that's that's now being added on top of the CARES Act and CRRSA. But uh, you know we are aware that there are there are schools on bases, and um, we can provide a very effective role there. Um, I think uh, there's a, a a new white paper that's really 
going to be great um, that should be released in about the next week or two um, that IUVA uh, is putting out that will show the efficacy against a whole host of different pathogens, particularly viruses in this in this first for, first swing at it. And 222 is actually shown to be more effective um, than 254 for the exact reasons that Jamie pointed out about the protein absorption um, curves and things like that. Um, and so, you know, a lot of this is is out there already and readily available uh, in terms of researching it. And um, I guess with that, I would uh, I I'd be ready to pass this into the Q and A session. Okay, sounds great. Again, greatly appreciate the presentation. We do have quite a few questions, so not sure the timing, how we'll do here, but I would think worst case, we can coordinate getting uh, questions answered after the fact. So first up, I'll pass this on and repeat the question. Uh, it was mentioned, research, uh, 222 nanometer LED lamps have efficiency, less than 1% today, what is the efficiency of an eczema lamp at this wavelength? So that's a good question, yeah. So even eczema lamps, which are the most efficient way of producing 222, are not super efficient. They're, uh, so the, most of the eczema lamps that we use are typically around uh, 6 to 8% efficient. Um, and uh, I think one thing that has to be kept in mind is that uh, most UV, um, you know, UV LEDs or UV lights in general are pretty inefficient. So let's say a typical UV LED in the, say, 260 to 270 nanometer range, they are pretty generally less than 10% efficient. So um, although eczema lamps are, uh, you know, only 6 to 8% efficient, that's actually pretty similar to uh, the UV LEDs that are commercially available now. So, um, so that doesn't sound very efficient, but it's actually uh, way more efficient than the, than the 222 LEDs in any case. Okay, thanks. Next question. What FDA hurdles are in the way of allowing widespread usage in public spaces? Yeah, I can I, I can cover that one. The uh, so interestingly enough, um, this is not regulated by the FDA for a very good reason. Um, the RUV is not a cure for COVID. Um, it doesn't treat the person, but what it does is it treats the 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 particles or the pathogens that are respirated into a space either into the air or on the surfaces and as a result um you know when talking to the F fda they said well all right describe what you do and we kind of went through that whole thing and they said okay well you're not you're not a medical device because you're you have no your intent is not to be used on people even if you could potentially um hit people um but you're regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency, by the EPA, um, and and then the manufacturers need to get registered with the EPA, and they have to, uh, you know, of course, abide by any uh, fee for labeling requirements, which talk about, you know, levels of safety or efficacy in in how they're in in how they're used there. So, um, yeah, the FDA. Now, you could be regulated by the FDA. However, if you were to say that it's intended for use on people like to um like if it was being used for ulcers or and we and we actually have looked at some of those th those things as well or battlefield battlefield wounds i think it's 87 percent of the people who suffer a uh an injury in battle uh don't die from the actual uh from the from the bullet or the shrapnel it's the disease that follows or it's it's the infection that follows and so we have looked a little bit at that, but I think right now most of the industry is focused on non-medical applications. I, I think there are medical applications for this that some people may eventually uh, target, but the, but the use cases that we're talking about here of, of cleaning the air and surface around you to prevent 
uh, the spread of an infectious disease are, are not an FDA regulated uh, item. Okay, again, thanks. Next question. Uh, I think this one's oriented towards the higher energy 222 nanometer. Will it have any negative impact to the stratum cordium, which is burning it? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It was very difficult to understand. You're, you're kind of breaking up. Yeah. Sorry about that. Hopefully, this will be clear. Again, the question was oriented towards will the higher energy, 222 nanometer, have a negative impact on the stratum corneum, such as burning it? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So, so the question is, does it does it harm your outer skin by being absorbed? And um, the answer is no, no, no. In fact, uh, you know, it does not harm your outer skin, uh, the fact that it is absorbed, um, because the actual total energy there is uh, no different from, let's say, the amount of energy that you would get from other light. So in other words, um, you know, ordinary, ordinary green light or ordinary blue light is also absorbed uh, by your skin. And that's not not uh, harming you. So um, so the answer is no. It does not heat you up. It does not harm your stress for NAM. Um, and uh, in fact, in general, it's also not harmful to materials. So Boeing's also done quite a bit of work on uh, you know does this damage uh, materials? So let's say uh, materials on aircraft. And the answer is uh, no. It may cause some discoloration of some materials, like like most UV does cause uh, discoloration of, of, or maybe cause fading or whatever of the, of the colors. But it does not uh, penetrate uh, deep into uh, structures and whatnot, so it does not affect their mechanical properties. So, and the same is true for you and your skin. It doesn't, you know, it's absorbed by your skin, but it doesn't harm your skin. Okay. Thanks. Next question. What are the absorption mechanisms for the 222 nanometer photons? So again, I'm, I'm having a hard time uh, understanding you. Could, could you repeat that again? Apologize. Again, hopefully this is coming through clear. What are the absorption mechanisms for the 222 nanometer photons? So if I understood you correctly, you're wondering what is the what are the absorption mechanisms for 22 photons? Um, so in the uh, as with all photon absorption mechanisms, um, it's uh, literally molecular, um, and uh, so in the case of, of both uh, protein and DNA, the uh, 222 nanometer photons are highly absorbed, um, and uh, so the, in, in the case of 254, it is it is less absorbed in protein. So I, I guess I'm I are they looking for a quantum mechanical answer? I'm 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 a little lost by the question actually. Here's here's a follow up interview. Hopefully you're you're getting this clear. Are any photochemical reactions driven in the dermal surface, or is it ultimately converted to heat slash temperature increases? Oh, I see. Okay. So in the case of of uh, let's say interaction with the DNA, so in the case of interaction with the DNA, what actually happens is the uh, uh, photons interact with the DNA and cause the breakage of uh, particular bonds. Um, and in the case of, uh, which is typically in thymine actually, and in the case of uh, pr uh, protein, um, the uh, uh, 222 nanometer UV uh, actually inter interacts with uh, peptide bonds. And uh, so in the case of, um, uh, in the case of, uh, let's say your skin cells, it is going to interact with the, your outer skin cells and uh, cause the breakage of peptide bonds in the membrane of the stratum corneum. Uh, but that, because those cells are already dead, uh, it doesn't really change them 
because although the, you know the uh, some protein bonds in the in the uh, uh, cell walls of your stratum carnaum have been have been altered, um, it hasn't really changed them because they're already dead. If those cells were live, then um, it could uh, you know it could damage the cell and and uh, uh, but it, again in the case of, of humans the stratum carnaum absorbs you know almost all the light. Okay, thanks. Um, next is, has there been any evaluation on the use of other gases such as argon or xenon? And then a follow-up, why was krypton gas chosen for use in the eczema lab? So yes, uh, you can uh, use uh, argon or uh, uh, xenon or, or in, you know, pretty much almost any, um, any uh, inert gas uh, for eczema lamps. And uh, what is the case there is that uh, you're looking for particular molecular combinations and you, and in eczema lamps, you pretty much always use a, uh, at least one of the two ga one of the gases is a, uh, is an inert gas. And uh, that is because uh, when you have an inert gas uh, in, in there, the, uh, uh, the molecules uh, created by the essentially the lightning strike uh, inherently want to decay immediately because an inert gas does not want to be in molecular form. So, um, in fact, uh, one type of, of uh, eczema lamp is a xenon lamp, so it's pure xenon, uh, which actually uh, creates uh, essentially a xenon two molecules, which immediately decay, and uh, and that. Uh, it's the it's the wavelengths associated with the decay that matter, and so um, the only system that we're aware of, and there may be other systems, but the only system that we're aware of that creates uh, a strong signal of 222 is uh, krypton and chloride. So uh, that doesn't mean that there are potentially others, but uh, we're not aware of them. Okay, thanks. Next question, what power densities are required to achieve the desired disinfection thresholds? Uh, I may take that one. So uh, I guess the disinfection threshold, uh, so if you're talking about the threshold being the threshold limit value, um, and, that, and that's very interesting because even at the 23 millijoules uh, per centimeter squared, what that's more or less telling you is if you can get a one log disinfection at um, at what with one millijoule per centimeter squared, it's more or less telling you then that you can get 23 one log reductions, you know, throughout that eight hour period. And that eight hour just resets every eight hours. So, you know, basically three times that much over the course of a day if it was a 24 seven application like a like a air traffic control tower or something like that. Um, but that's where it is today. But when it then moves to 500 millijoules, uh, or I think the notice of intent to change that's been uh, already announced by ACGIH is, you know, upper like 493 or seven or something like that. Um, you're now talking about, you know, really repeated ability to, you know, create uh, those levels of, di of disinfection really in under a minute, um, you know, throughout the course of a, uh, throughout the course of the day. So I think if that's the question in terms of how much, how much are we able to safely do right now under the existing standards and under the standards that we expect within the next, you know, three to six to 12 months, um, those are the kind of levels that we're talking about. So, you know, and, and the higher that threshold goes, effectively, we have the tools to to deliver the higher power thresholds with the lights. Um, if anything, what we do right now is we we use programming to just turn them off and on to deliver you know a customized amount to any given space based on the ceiling height, um, and and that's how it's delivered. But but it will get to a point where it's a little bit more like a, a just a, a purely continuous um, disinfection instantaneously. The second it does come out of your mouth, uh, the particle, um, it, it is started to be treated uh, and, and disinfected right now, and it's only going to get faster in terms of how much it can. 
Okay, thanks. Um, we're about five minutes after the hour. What I'd like to do, if you're amenable, Jamie, uh, TJ, I can keep going through the questions, but certainly we would want to get the uh, written responses and ideally post them to the briefing. Is that something we could work? And do you? Sure. Does it, okay, does it work to continue then going through the we've got several more questions? So it's probably gonna be another 15 minutes maybe. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's go for another another fifteen minutes and see if we can't get them done. Okay, we'll do. Next is a consideration aspect. His um, question: With might these also be useful for treating wounds on the battlefield? Yeah, actually, that, that is. That a, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll uh, touch on this one, PJ, for just. Yeah, so that, that's an application that we uh, have looked at, and um, uh, I think the answer is is yes. And uh, you know, there you know we don't have a lot of data on that, but uh, yes, I think that you know the um, you know the wand product that uh, PJ showed is would certainly be appropriate for for that uh, kind of thing, and and you know I think considerably more data would need to be collected before you would. Uh, take that, uh, you know, live onto the battlefield, but but it uh, does seem like uh, that is a possibility. Yes, we actually um, we actually had designed a wand earlier under a NASA contract um, that that uh, was given an XTEC search award by the Army for exactly that concept. It didn't get deployed. Um, but it was kind of an earlier stage. It was really prototype level, and I think with the with the new additional information now, it's certainly something worth worth re exploring. Thanks. The next question folds around uh, overall cost effectiveness. Um, the question is looking at self decon of surfaces versus disinfect disinfecting the surfaces. Uh, potentially um, repeatedly at a significantly higher cost. So again, anything with respect to overall cost effectiveness of the 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 uh, UV disinfection versus self decounting. Yeah, yeah, I I think I touched on that briefly before. Um, you know, with the concept of just somebody wiping down surfaces all the time um can be anywhere from 50 to 100 times more costly than the daily cost of you know providing um you know this 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 far uv solution um you know a light will last you know a good thousand days depending on the on the cycling that that you're using and so you know if you simply extrapolate what the cost of you know if you had a person who was uh, wiping stuff down every day for 10 days at minimum wage, that'd be about $100 a day. So over a thousand days, that would be um, upwards of $100,000 uh, to wipe stuff down versus the cost of this equipment, which is, you know, anywhere from $2,500 uh, today and, and actually, you know, reducing as the economies of scale continue to grow. So it's, it's considerably cheaper. And more importantly, the, the hard thing is, is in their space, it's this invisible threat. We don't want. We don't know when it's there. You can't smell it. You can't see it. Um, so having a persistent, continuous disinfection, I think, is also far more effective. Um, if you knew it was there, then you could have, you know, much easier stay stay away from it. But but you don't. So I think this is a a more comprehensive solution and at at a fraction of the cost, actually. Okay. Thanks. The next one folds to. Uh, Basically, kind of the empirical how clean is clean. Um, the individual is noting that they tried to get, uh, you know, express, I guess, QC checks from DHS or HHS. So ultimately, when you say something is disinfected, to to what level? Um, the interest is to determine some kind of uh, testing to determine to what level is the contamination complete. Dis disinfection complete. Sure. Um, so that's an that's an interesting question. Um, 
And what is interesting with a, a far UV source is, in theory, if it's continuously disinfecting, it will continue taking it down. So you may have that, you know, one log reduction in, you know, X minutes, and then another X minutes from them, the same, the same interval, you'll have another log reduction. So in theory, it doesn't necessarily stop at 99%. It'll just keep adding nines uh, in, in, a, in a log reduction, 99.99, et cetera. Um, in terms of how clean you need to be to prevent uh, infection is a very challenging question um, because we ultimately now you're, you're, you're referencing the relative vulnerability of different people's individual immune systems. And so while we don't know those, by knowing what, what, we, what we do know is we do know exactly at any given inch square or cubic inch in a room exactly how much disinfection we can provide against a given pathogen. And so it's that our goal is to just reduce the viral load so that, you know, perhaps we not only keep the people, you know, from catching it who are usually pretty bulletproof to, uh, to, to getting uh, um, illnesses to all the way to the most vulnerable. Um, of, of those, you know, if, if it's a medical situation where somebody's immunocompromised from from the medicine they're taking or something like that already, um, you know, if you can continue to reduce that viral load as much as you can, that would be there. But I don't think that's an easily, if I understand the question right, I don't think it's something that the DHS or the HHS could could specifically determine in terms of what viral load is that I know they have done some studies that have tried to estimate that, um, but I don't think there's a consensus around it uh, with, with SARS-CoV-2 at this point. Okay, thanks. Next question, is there a wraparound application available which could address pathogens that are not in the line of sight, or would this challenge require the installation of additional fixtures as a solution? Um, well, the uh, wand that, that, that Jamie showed that, that Boeing developed is, uh, is a good example of one that addresses, I think this question is really addressing potential shadowing um, with line of sight. And so in that case, um, you know, the wand waves over a surface and that allows it to kind of get hit in all the nooks and crannies, let's say, you know, in that cockpit example um, of that. Um, but as far as treating under tables or desks or things like that, I would go back to the concept of how the pathogens actually, what surfaces they end up falling to. And in almost every case, it's going to be the top of whatever the surface it falls to, whether that's a desk or the floor or a chair or a person. And that's what makes the overhead fixture so effective is those typically are within the line of sight of a of the tops of the surfaces throughout a room um, and and in some cases you know you won't have one light in the room so you will be hitting things from different angles as well and so it may not cover everything but i think it's going to cover the majority of what the risk profile would be in a in a respiratory uh, um, infectious disease Okay, thanks. Next question is oriented towards the prospect of the 222 nanometer UV light creating ozone um, with respect to ozone being potentially problematic to health. So again, the ultimate question is, does the 222 nanometer UV create ozone as a byproduct? Yeah, let me, uh, let, me, let me touch on this one, PJ. Um, so uh, the, the short answer is yes. 222 does create a uh, small amount of ozone, but um, it uh, turns out, at least in, in uh, the Boeing studies, that at the uh, uh, even with a very very powerful wand. So let's say uh, when uh, we've you know used a, uh, a very powerful 222 wand that is not even sealed um, on flight decks, uh, we stay below the uh, ozone uh, regulatory limits. And in the case of the type of systems for these persistent UV, um, those systems actually generate almost no ozone. So when we do testing of a, uh, 
uh, one of these smaller systems that are is you know let's say permanently installed um, or that's a, that's its intention in any case um, we see uh, something in you know in the neighborhood of maybe one part per billion of ozone generated uh, on a uh, you know as a compared to the background and to put that in in uh, in scale uh, you're allowed to have a hundred parts per billion um, on a on a continuous basis on a 24/7 basis, um, and you're allowed to have 300 parts per billion on a, a temporary basis. So one part per billion is that's that's pretty much background. So effectively, no, there's no ozone issues whatsoever. Okay, thanks. Next question is. Um, most modern polymers are not UV stabilized like exterior grade polymers. Will we have to replace all of our interior polymers if UV begins to be widely used? So, uh, if I did I understand the question correctly, are they wondering what's the effect of 222 on polymers, or what, what was the question? Again, it's it's acknowledging that. Um, there's a concern with respect to most modern day polymers with respect to uh, UV breaking them down. So the question is, will we have to replace all of our interior polymers if UV begins to be widely used? Okay, uh, yeah, actually we've studied that quite extensively. So, so Boeing has studied this quite extensively because uh, we're looking at using 222 on uh, aircraft interiors and aircraft interiors have, uh, of course, a lot, a lot of polymers uh, in them. And um, so what we found is that actually in terms of damage, structural damage to uh, polymers, so their ability to, uh, you know, withstand, uh, you know, to, to meet their structural loads and uh, their ability to resist uh, uh, fire and, and other important uh, structural mechanical properties, 222 appears to have no effect on that whatsoever. And the reason appears to be the case that um, because 222 does not penetrate very deeply into polymers, um, so keep in mind that this, let's say 222 is likely to penetrate only a few microns into uh, the polymer, so probably uh, less than, say, 10 microns into a polymer. So to sort of put that in scale, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a, uh, just a typical paint coating is going to be more than that, right? So, um, so the, you know, really even uh, uh, lifetime exposure to 222, it may cause, let's say, the paint to, to, to fade, uh, but it is not going to cause uh, structural damage to the underlying polymer structure, no. Okay, thanks. Next question, kind of acknowledge, this is first an acknowledgement and then a followed by a question. This technology can eradicate most pathogenic disease when implemented in all Habitable spaces and the international initiative to reduce the cost and ensure widespread availability of eczema and solid state light sources is imperative to eliminate current and future pandemic and all bacterial disease. Have the top tiers of UD and all government agencies been briefed on this? Well, I would I would say that part of this part of this uh this webinar is to help spread awareness. Awareness is the most important thing, I think, for this technology right now. And hopefully, uh, I believe this will be recorded and, and stay available. Um, but uh, you know, we've we've been doing our best to try to to uh, to bring awareness uh, to this, and it, it has uh, reached several layers. Although uh, I know it's installed at the top tiers of the Pentagon, so I think that that kind of starts to address, I think, where you're going with it, but has it really been penetrated? No, we're just at the very, very beginning. Um, and so awareness is key. I, I hope I hope you all spread the word. Yes, correct. That is an objective of the webinar and it is recorded, so. 
possible. Hopefully the word will get out. The next question is, is 222 nanometer light safe to shine in the nose and mouth or just the eyes? So again, uh, you know, I think that the short answer to that is uh, it's, it's possible that it is to shine, uh, you know, it's safe to shine into the interior of humans. Um, but we don't have specific data on that. Um, what would be the case is that it uh, would uh, not make it past the surface uh, the surface cells. So it uh, would penetrate uh, whatever cells were on the actual exterior of the uh, of the inside of your nose or the exterior cells on the inside of your mouth. Uh, so it, it would penetrate into that very first cell layer, um, just like it does, you know, penetrate slightly into the, uh, the stratum corneum. Um, and I, you know, whether penetrating that very outer cell layer uh, causes you any harm, I, I, I don't know. We haven't studied that. So, uh, so I think the answer is uh, probably it's safe, or at least re reasonably likely that it's safe. But uh, we we don't have that data, so I can't say for sure. Well, and I would I would add on to that that the the incidence. Um, so so typically the far UV light will be strongest directly in front of wherever that lamp is pointing. Um, and so in let's say a ceiling application, it's pointing straight down. So to get into your nose um, in like that kind of an application, you'd probably have to be standing on your hands um, upside down um, somewhat. And so I and 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 I'm not trying to be flippant about that. There's actually quite a bit of study that was done on upper air UV disinfection beforehand, where they kind of note that even with the eye. Um, for a ceiling mounted unit or something from up high, the angle of incidence or the angle of dispersion uh, is so low, the relative intensity of the light is so low at a part where it would get hit and the actual eyelid actually shelters the eye mostly from, from, from that light unless you were to just stare up at it for you know, an extended period. And, and even in that case, um, you know, the, the, the fixtures are designed to, to maintain that safety. So, so that, that's kind of the first half of it. The other aspect is, again, the fixtures out there right now are not designed for use on people or in people. It's more of incident exposure. And so if you were gonna be sticking, you know, a far UV light in your nose or your mouth on purpose, like maybe in a dental application or some kind of medical application, that's when you would trigger an FDA approval and all of those studies uh, would potentially be required. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll let, let me add something to that, which which is that yeah, I I think that in the case of let's say the incidental amount of light that might enter your nose or enter your mouth from a uh, uh, a lamp right. that was ceiling, that would be no issue whatsoever because because uh, even under the current PLV, which is, doesn't even include any of the recent safe safety data, you would be allowed 23 millijoules. So um, and so even the 23 millijoule number, you know, would not be accumulated in your mouth, uh, even if you held your mouth open, you know, to the to the light for quite some time. So yeah, I, from a standpoint of just normal exposure to a, a light matter in the ceiling, that would be no no issue whatsoever in the nose or the mouth. Okay, thanks. Uh, again, we've kind of went beyond the 15 minutes, but I'm going to throw out I think. Two more questions here that are fairly short and you know, probably would require a fairly short response, but we still have well over a dozen more. I'm going to say probably best to cut it off after that, and then we'll get you know, written responses and post them out, or again, to distribute them to the attendee list. So uh, the one quick short one is that one lamp, one lamp can cover how many square feet? And the next question is, is it effective, equally effective, for all 
disinfection as for, or, or sorry, or is it equally effective for air disinfection as it is for surfaces? Uh, I can take some of that. Uh, it, it depends on the fixture in terms of how many square feet. Um, there are different powered lights, um, much in the way, you know, if you've got a light bulb for your lamp, uh, you could have a 40 watt lamp uh, light bulb or 100 watt, you know, or equivalents these days. I guess they do it in lumens because it's more LED than anything right now. Uh, so that will determine the amount of square feet. A lot of what currently is out there are you know, anywhere from either uh, a regular ceiling, you know, under 11 foot ceiling would probably be up to about 250 square feet. And it, again, it's, that's a relative basis. It, you know, there is an angle, about an 80 degree uh, angle of dispersion. So it can cover everything in the room. It's just the further away you get, um, the less disinfection it's got because the intensity of the light changes. Almost like with a flashlight as you, as if you hold it close to the wall, it's very bright in a in a very small circular pattern. And then the farther away you back up from the wall, the wider that light gets, but also the less bright it gets um, because it's basically uh, uh, going further up, further out to the sides, that, the angle of, of dispersion. So um, that's the rough amount that a ceiling light could ha handle. Um, but the lamps that are available now, like the ones that uh, uh, Jamie mentioned at Boeing, those are very powerful lamps and they could cover much more. It's just a function of how they're applied uh, and the ceiling heights typically drive most of that. The difference between an eight foot ceiling and a 10 foot ceiling is actually pretty significant in, in how wide that, that coverage is. As far as air versus surfaces, um, uh, it has been proven, and some of the, the, the data that Dr. Brenner at Columbia has uh, did quite a bit on the air side, and it is kind of uh, an intuitive aspect that it, it's easier to kill something in the air because there are really no line of sight issues in the air unless it's smoky or something, you know, unless there was a thick substance of something in the air, but it has to be pretty thick. Um, uh, on surfaces, however, um, it does depend on what the surface is. Um, so if you have a smooth surface, um, like a metal table or a, a, a plastic surface or something like that, it's gonna be very effective. If you have a, an organic surface, and we did a lot of testing under our NASA contract on different foods, um, looking at you know, food disinfection and life, shelf life extension and whatnot, Turns out the surface of a food under a microscope is actually very porous and hairy and a lot of things like that. And so it can be, it can be less effective on some surfaces. So it varies quite a bit in surfaces. In air though, it's pretty, it's an easier kill. Also, remember the closer to the light you are, um, the more disinfection you're gonna have. So presumably it's treating whatever surface it hits, but it's also treating all the air in between the light and that surface. So just almost by definition, it's getting more fluence um, uh, or more dosage of the of the far UV, um, you know, in air versus at the surface, which is kind of the furthest length that it would that it would be. Hopefully that uh, touches on it. I don't know, Jamie, if you had any other thoughts. Yeah, well, I, I guess what I would, I would also kind of add to that is is that um, so if the question is you know what are the you know how much light is necessary and how effective is it so yeah so it's just as effective on things that are in the air as it is on surfaces if not more so um, but also the uh, different pathogens require different amounts of total. Uh, ultraviolet energy to uh, be effective at killing them. So, um, so I think you know the answer is highly dependent on the exact pathogen you're trying to kill, um, and uh, and as as PJ said, essentially the the range to uh, to the to the bulb and the and the power of the bulb itself. Okay, greatly appreciate the time and responses, Jamie. DJ, I'd say at this point, we probably want to cut it off. It's 1.30 now, we've been 30 minutes over, and we could, I'm guessing, probably have about 15 more minutes to answer the remainder of the questions. So again, with your agreement, we will go ahead and coordinate getting those questions to you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, responding and you know, writing, and we can get those out to the attendees and post it with the briefing as well. Sounds good.
Uh, right. Thank you. Well, yes, thank, thank you, you both very much. Appreciate everyone's attendance and time. And hopefully, again, getting uh, certainly this is an in vogue topic and has created quite a, a thought provoking discussion. So, again, appreciate uh, folks' attendance and look forward to hearing or seeing from you in future webinars or in various information analysis center support efforts to the DS community. So again, thanks much for everyone's time. Take care all. All right. Thank